Good afternoon, my friends. Or actually, I believe it's still morning here. Saturday, the 13th of November, 2021. And uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about narcissism in this country, but more specifically, I guess, about my reasons for wanting to kind of get away from the city. I'm going to start out with a discussion about us wanting to move to Kentucky or out in the country. And then I'd like to read from a book that I found the other day. You know, some people, some people ask me, where do you get the topics for your videos? You know, and uh, do you, where do you find them? Or, you know, what inspires you? And I say, I don't find the topics for my videos. They find me. If I am, if I find something that inspires me or frustrates me, whatever it may be, and this can lead either way. With some channels, you find that, you know, they might focus on strictly the problems in the world and others just try to keep it always positive. I'm always trying to stay in the middle, and that's very difficult because I need to discuss the negativity within society in order to make a change. You see what I mean? All of us to make a change. And I feel like what we're going through right now in society is much bigger than... <laughs> finances or COVID or any type of uh, uh, belief of a rapture or anything like this, regardless of your roots of belief and what you think is happening around the world and for what reasons, overall there seems to be a major global change going on that is very difficult to put our fingers on. But it's funny because regarding the topic of narcissism, you know, I thought about this the other day, I was walking my son home from school, and we stopped at the little library. Now, I don't know if you have these in your neighborhood, but they're these little library boxes about this big with a plexiglass door and a little roof, and they're on usually a post or something, and it's just like it sounds. It's a little library where you can drop off books that other people can just take. It's just give and take. And they're usually pretty well stocked, and there's three of them around my neighborhood. And... There's one right in front of the school, and he leaned in and was looking for a book, and so I kind of leaned over, and I just pulled out this thick book right there. And uh, I said, well, this definitely isn't a kid's book. <laughs> it's called The Culture of Narcissism, American Life in an Age of Diminishing Expectations. And I said, this is just going to be perfect. And I brought it home. I haven't read any of it, but I flipped to a random page, and I said, "This whatever page I flip to is going to be the discussion I need, I'm going to have with my subscribers, and... It was the perfect page. I mean, I don't know how all of you, you know, your beliefs go about spirituality or uh, connection to nature, but I, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe in a, uh, that we do get messages, okay? Let's just put it that way. That if we're paying attention, we can once in a while tap into the strange web, the pattern of life, and uh, something just works out the way we anticipate it. This may be confirmation bias, but it, that's for another discussion altogether. So the page I'd like to read, and mind you, this book is from 1979. This book is actually, I was four years old when it came out. It's, so it's 40 years old, and it's still relevant, always will be relevant, most likely. But it's just a little chapter I'd like to read at the end that I flipped to. And this is, mind you, they're talking about research from the 1960s, I believe. <clears throat> and it'll just tap right into the story, and they're talking about a couple different doctors and scientists. It says, Research into small groups, according to McGregor, showed that groups function best when everyone speaks his mind. When people listen as well as speak. And when disagreements surface without causing obvious tensions. When the chairman of the board does not try to dominate his subordinates, and when decisions rest on consensus. These precepts, which by this time had become the common coin of the social sciences, summarize the therapeutic view of authority. The growing acceptance of that view at all levels of American society makes it possible to preserve hierarchical forms of organization in the guise of participation. It provides a society dominated by corporate elites with an anti-elitist ideology, the popularization of therapeutic modes of thought discredits authority, especially in the home and the classroom, while leaving domination uncriticized. 
Therapeutic forms of social control by softening or eliminating the adversarial relation between subordinates and superiors makes it more and more difficult for citizens to defend themselves against the state or for workers to resist the demands of the corporation. As the ideas of guilt and innocence lose their moral and even legal meaning, those in power no longer enforce their rules by means of the authoritative edicts of judges, magistrates, teachers, and preachers. Society no longer expects authorities to articulate a clearly reasoned, elaborately justified code of law and morality, nor does it expect the young to internalize the moral standards of the community. It demands only conformity of the community. It demands only, sorry, it demands only conformity to the conventions of everyday intercourse, sanctioned by psychiatric definitions of normal behavior. In the hierarchies of work and power, as in the family, the decline of authority does not lead to the collapse of social constraints. It merely deprives those constraints of irrational basis. Just as the parent's failure to administer just punishment to the child undermines the child's self-esteem rather than strengthening it, so the corruptibility of public authorities, their acquiescence in minor forms of wrongdoing, reminds the subordinate of his subordination by making him dependent on the indulgences of those above him. The new style bureaucrat whose ideology and character supports hierarchy even though he's neither paternalistic nor authoritarian. As Michael McCabe puts it in his study of the corporate gamesman, he no longer orders his inferiors around, but he's discovered subtler means of keeping them in their place. Even though his underlings often realize that they have been conned, pushed around, and manipulated, they find it hard to resist such easygoing oppression. The diffusion of responsibility in large organizations Moreover, enables the modern manager to delegate discipline to others, to blame unpopular decisions on the company in general, and thus to preserve his standing as a friendly advisor to those beneath him. Yet his entire demeanor conveys to them that he remains a winner in a game most of them are destined to lose. Since everyone allegedly plays this game by the same rules, no one can begrudge him his success but neither can the losers escape the heavy sense of their own failure. In a society without authority, the lower orders no longer experience oppression as guilt. Instead, they internalize a grandiose idea of the opportunities open to all, together with an inflated opinion of their own capacities. If the lowly man re resents those more highly placed, it is only because he suspects them of grandly violating the regulations of the game as he would like to do himself if he dared, it never occurs to him to insist on a new set of rules. Extremely key right there. I know that's kind of hard reading. It's, it's difficult to process, for me anyway, when I'm reading it out loud, but that we've become passive sheep in our own uh, of our own doing. You know, it's, it's easy to say that people are being corralled and forced to do things, but in reality we find that people are more than willing to do whatever they think is important, uh, as long as it agrees with their, uh, their basic biases, and also they can retain their comforts and their simplistic, you know, way of thinking. What I've learned is most people have no interest in really reaching out and learning anything new. They just want to confirm what they already think they know, which can be frustrating when a person changes their mind quite often, you find yourself being omitted from cer certain groups because you can't agree on all principles. The concept there was that open discussion is paramount, but that very last line, that it never occurs to man to change the game. And that's where we're at right now. That's what I believe is going on. I don't want to dwell on the negatives. For me, my life has to be about my family and my experiences. So I think what's holding a lot of us back is first a fear of diminishing returns. It's, well, I should say, uh, we have diminishing returns on a lot of our investments, things that we put so much time into as a society. And then we find out maybe it's not working, but we continue to dig in deeper. That's what they call the sunk cost fallacy. It's 
best explained when you're watching a movie and you're halfway through and you realize it sucks, but you just watch the rest anyway because you've already put that time into it. So instead of saving some time, you continue to waste more time. And it's the way we can get stuck in one routine. I've lived in my same house for 17 years now. I like where I live, or at least I have up to this point. Uh, but I want my family to experience some living on some acreage, living in a farmhouse. Um, so we've been looking to move from, you know, the Portland area to Kentucky, which is a complete, completely new endeavor for us and something I really, I've always wanted to move, but never thought I would consider that. But the point I want to make here is that there's often a fear of change. It's scary. You know, like some one of my friends said, well, if that's something that, you know, excites you and, and, and you're passionate about it, I was like, well, it's, it scares the shit out of me because I don't want to take a chance and fail. But you don't regret the things that you failed. You regret the things that you tried at, or didn't try, not the things you tried and failed at. Everything is a learning experience. But we have a fear of change and there's no risk, no reward. All these sayings that we're well aware of. But this is where it comes to the point of how these connect with what I was talking about a minute ago with the narcissism. Xenophobia or the fear of other people or other cultures is something that arises from our own lack of interaction with other people and other cultures. And this has been a big issue right now because what we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. This is a pretty well known phenomenon, right? It's the, that bell curve, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, where the less you know, the more you think you know. And we find that those who know very little are often the loudest voices with the most time on their hands and the least to lose. And they can go scream on the internet about how this person's this or this person's that. Basically create any story out of thin air. And what the internet has done is allowed us to take one little grain of truth and blow it up into a big fake story or even something that maybe is true but really doesn't matter as much and convince other people that this particular topic should piss them off and that they should be angry about everything. But what we find, what I find, is that more often than not, when people are complaining and riling people up, it's against other people. And I don't doubt that some people do need to be confronted for the things that they've done, but it's very rarely the right people. They'll be criticizing some Democratic senator rather than a CEO of a major tech company or a CEO of a major, you know, international pharmaceutical rep or something that, you know, has been known to continually put out shitty products. There is still some good journalism out there, but the point here is that we're isolating ourselves and um, I hate to put it this way, but we have sold out and subcontracted our knowledge out to others, to the media, or to leaders, or presidents, or Congress people, lawyers, mayors, whatever it might be. We trust others to the point where we think that they know what's best for us. And as a personal Personal note, I have a strong distrust of authority, and I always have. Sometimes, to my own downfall, perhaps, I, you know, there are times when people know more about a topic than I do. Now, that's what I call authority. Authority, author, you know, as in you're the one who understands this best, or you're the creator or writer of it. Uh, you know the knowledge better than I do, then I will listen. But what we found, we're finding is that the people who have the least knowledge aren't even allowing those with knowledge to speak. So we're becoming more socially isolated and creating more and more frustrations towards one another. And if we continue down this path, the cities will just get worse and worse. But the entire world is in this situation. The internet, you know, uh, social media has allowed wars to take place and slaughters as people can organize in groups they never could before. We have, technology is a tool, but it can be used as a weapon. But here's the biggest issue here. Because we're so isolated, we're not able to talk face-to-face -face anymore with people. And face-to-face -face is much more important than we ever wanted to believe. It doesn't cut it that we're on Zoom call or, you know, using FaceTime. It is not the same. Being in somebody's company, there's a connection there that is unique. Seeing people eye-to-eye -eye and having a conversation won't lead to some of these petty insults and fights that we see so often. But the more we isolate, 
the more we, we misinterpret somebody's text message or misinterpret an email or misunderstand a comment and think it's the world's ending over it. The truth is, we really have let technology destroy the way that we communicate. And we know less than we ever knew before. We have devices in our hands that can give us all the information that we could possibly desire. But we squandered it. Instead of long-form discussions or podcasts or, you know, knowledge or philosophy or Greek culture or learning about anything interesting, everybody's sitting there on TikTok with little 30-second, you know, sound bites, just dopamine hits. It's a sad, sad state of affairs. <laughs> but not only do we know less than ever before, but the one thing that we do know is that nobody's going to change. That it's, I know that sounds nihilistic, and it is kind of a, a reality of discoveries within nihilism that people, that inherently, once you learned enough about history and how humans act, you realize that you can't overcome human nature. At least not, at least not any time soon. Therefore, we will never have this perfect utopia. There will always be somebody out there running amok, and corporations won't change. Just like I was reading in that book, uh, the corporations nobody takes any accountability. And over the past several decades, they've just retained more and more power over Congress, over the laws, over the FDA, and basically, it's the corporations that tell us what the science is now. And that's a very scary thing. There's no peer-reviewed studies anymore. People are just told to believe whatever they're told. And they do. And that's perhaps the biggest revelation I've had in the last few years. That people really don't want to think. They don't want to read. They don't want to learn. They just want to hear what they want to hear. There's many exceptions to this. You know, I made this video the other day called It's Okay to Change Your Mind, and it's funny because I came across a couple other videos recently just like that, like Brett and Heather Weinstein did this one, of things that they had misunderstandings on in the past. Things like, well, I used to believe in this about gun control, or I used to believe in this about, you know, drugs, or whatever it might be, and admitting that you made a mistake or that you had an error in judgment, that you've received more information and therefore you're able to change your mind. People are scared of that. They don't know what to do with it. You never, I, I personally never hear a person say, oh, good for you, you changed your mind, unless what you changed your mind to was agreeing with them. And uh, I think that's also part of human nature. I mean, it's something that's inescapable. But our own ignorance will be our downfall, if anything. The fact that with all the information at our fingertips, there was a point where we could gather knowledge, and we still can, but now it's so obscured by biased information um, that it's very difficult to even know what's true and this is angering people because when you lose faith in authority you lose faith in the system and when you lose faith in the system it's contagious it's an emotional contagion and we see it unfolding right now in society it's our own collective narcissism that's destroying us and we have to find our community this could be a community online if it has to be but find a community that isn't a community based on hatred of another community. You see what I mean? Not joining a political side or a religion that excludes all other religions. No. We join a group that is open and accepting of human nature. People who we can sit and talk to. It doesn't have to be many. Two or three people. That's why I'm glad to have YouTube. And all of you. And somebody the other day said, No, you know, you should have more subscribers. And I said, I, I'm actually glad that I don't. There's times when I think, sure, I'd love to make a career out of it and make enough, but right now I could answer my subscribers. I only got a few hundred people, and I, you know, not everyone comments, so it's, you know, at least I can read every comment. I can't imagine just being so distant from my audience because this is based on reciprocal information, gaining knowledge, sharing knowledge, and I think a lot of us have grown over the last several years. So when a person changes their mind, it shouldn't be an I told you so kind of moment. It should be like, okay, well, let's talk about this further. And maybe why did you think what you thought before? Or how can we change this in the future or overcome some of the adversity 
But, which brings me back to my discussion about wanting to move out of the city in Kentucky, I don't have any interest in trying to fix society, at least not from the uh, from the uh, physical, on the streets, or on the inside. It's not in my interest. I feel like <clears throat> we've hit a precipice, a point where we're a little too far to pull back to what we thought we might have by now. <laughs> if that makes sense, probably not. But anyhow, I think that uh, I need to find my own niche, my own ways to help people, help the world, but really, it is what it is. All of us have to not be woke, we just have to be awake. We have to be aware of that a lot of people have a, lot, a vested interest in lying to us, but that there are still trustworthy people out there. And uh, we should celebrate that. So I think those are the final notes. I could go on about this, but I wanted to keep it brief. 20 minutes is pretty brief for my channel, I suppose. And... Um, yeah, it's been an interesting ride the last couple of years. Um, I have tried to really check myself, check my emotions. And surprisingly, while I've changed my mind about more things probably over the last two years than I have in the last you know, two decades, um, I've found that others have taken the exact opposite stance. They have dug in so deep on their principles that they refuse to even budge on discussions or anything. This has happened all around the world. I've talked to so many people and read so many articles of those who are actually willing to leave their friendships over discussions about getting a shot. To me, that's absurd. I have friends who disagree with me on politics, friends who disagree with me on medical procedures. Your life is your life. I'm not there for your you know, to tell you what to do with your health or, or how to handle yourself. As long as you're a good person and we have a good relationship, I like spending time with people. It's sad to me people give up relationships over something so petty, but it tells you that society is hitting a point, something you might call first world problems. We argue and squabble about the pettiest things because we're able to. And that might not be an option if things get worse, but only time will tell. Anyway, thanks for listening. And um, I'll talk to you all next time. Be well. Take care of each other and yourselves. Please. For the love of the spaghetti monster. <laughs>